And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Wiles. Today is Thursday, July 24, 2014. This program was pre-recorded on Monday, July 21st. By the time you hear this program, I will be in Idaho attending a private meeting. Now, I'm going to hold a breakfast meeting with True News listeners on Saturday morning before flying back to Florida. And if you've not registered, there is still time. You can email us at info at truenews.com, true without an E, info at truenews.com, T-R-U-N-E-W-S, or you can call the office at 772 579-8880. Now, the breakfast meeting will be held at the Best Western Hotel in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. We will start promptly at 7.30 a.m. This is a breakfast buffet, and we will go until 10.30 a.m. I hope we're not going to be eating that long, but the meeting will go until 10.30 a.m. I will talk a little bit and then answer your questions. As I said, it's a, it's a, a, a buffet breakfast, all you can eat, and we're only asking the attendees to cover the cost of the meal. This is not a fundraiser or anything like that. Uh, it's $22 per person, and that price includes the sales tax and the service tip. Now, several couples have uh, told us that they need to bring their children along. Uh, that's okay with me. Um, you know, we'll just make the rule children under 12 eat free. And, um, you know, True News will pick up any additional expense uh if there is any from from the restaurant, so don't worry about that. If if you have to bring your children, please do so. Uh, to make this easy on me, because I'm not, you know, we're not making this into a major event. Uh, just bring a check or or cash, and and we'll just have a basket at the at the front of the food line. Just drop it in the basket, and this will be an honor system. Okay. Uh, make the check payable to True News, and then I'll pay the hotel restaurant with our credit card. And that'll make it real easy rather than the hotel um, giving um, meal tickets to everybody there and, and then trying to keep track of all that. So I just want to keep this real simple and easy. Now, you know, originally I I only expected a handful of people to come over to the restaurant to sit around the table, drink coffee, and talk. I didn't expect it to turn into a major event. There are people driving from California, Montana, Oregon, and Washington State to attend. And this has gone from a small get-together to a fairly large event. So now I have to comb my hair, brush my teeth, and shave on a Saturday morning. Oh, well, it's going to be worth it. I'm looking forward to personally meeting many of our True News uh, listeners in the Idaho-Washington State region. And it's going to be a very, very good time together. Again, if you're certain you will attend on this Saturday, July 26, 7.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m., Best Western Hotel, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, then notify us so that we can alert the restaurant to cook more food. Please email us at info at truenews.com or call the office at 772-569-8880. This is going to be fun. I'm really excited about meeting our family face-to-face. I hope my face doesn't scare you, especially before eating breakfast. Um, Well, I hope this interview doesn't scare you, too. Uh, Throughout 15 years of broadcasting, I have maintained a general rule that I do not interview guests who have an assumed name. 
And I can think of only three or four people that I have allowed on this program um, without identifying their uh, their name, their true identity. Uh, and, uh, you know, truthfully, I can understand from time to time there are people that have something to tell us and they simply cannot be identified. Uh, things are getting downright weird and dangerous. And sometimes guests have to conceal their identity for either personal safety reasons or to shield their business or professional career from uh, blowback. The danger in interviewing a guest with an assumed name is that it's hard for me to verify the veracity of the information that's being passed along on the program. So then I'm at risk. I'm making an exception today uh, to interview a man who is known only as V. Uh, the little bit I know about his professional background, and I may be wrong, I'll find out here in a minute, is uh, that he was a senior trader for a major European bank. Now, I have followed him for several years. Uh, I've read his analysis of what is happening to the global financial system, and often he is eerily right, such as his cryptic warning late last year that a hit team, an assassination team was going to be turned loose to kill bankers. And about a month or so later, bankers started jumping off the top of skyscrapers. So that would make me sit up and pay more attention to V. So V is on the telephone, so I don't know how I can introduce a guest who only has a letter for a name. V, welcome to True News. Glad to be on board, Rick. Uh, glad to be on board uh, for all your listening audiences. Um, I guess uh, since this is a new program and a new audience, and those that do know me and those that don't know, I'm just going to reintroduce myself. And for those who are hearing me for the first time, I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of a background on who I am and what it is I do and why I go under the moniker V, the, the Gorilla Economist. Um, First off, I, I cut my teeth in banking almost a decade ago, and uh, I got my start as a as a broker for a major European commodity firm. Uh, a, it's a very well known firm, and the man who brought me under his wings and taught me the ropes is a, is a legend in the field. To this day, that gentleman goes down to Washington D.C., speaks with senators, lobbies, congressmen. He's a heavy hitter, a major power player. This guy was so good at what he did, he retired at the age of 33. So uh, there's some uh, numerology there for all you esoteric types, but it also shows you the prominence of this individual. If I, I can't give too much information away, otherwise you'd know who it is. So learning the ropes, making the contacts, and being proficient in what I do. I cut my teeth on strategic metals. <clears throat> I took, took care of the whole entire program of strategic metals uh, for this particular firm, and I took it from basically um, Africa, where it was mined and refined in Europe and, and traded throughout the world through our various trading partners in Asia and in America and all, all over. From there, I went to a major U.K. investment bank. At that time, it was the largest investment bank in the world um, by assets, and uh, I became privy to a lot of things that I didn't like. Uh, I realized, okay, there's one thing in commodities where we base it not on performance but on volume. There, right there, is a conflict of interest. But in the banking and the trading world, we figured out, well, I figured out that uh, it's not just the volume that makes this thing a, 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 uh, a monster to deal with, but the simple fact of various levels of fraud. I began to voice my concerns, and uh, in clear conscience, I can no longer be a part of that world. I still have professional contacts. I still do professional work. That's why I cannot have any blowback, number one, on my professional work that I do, number one. And number two, I have an impeccable track record. Uh, so far, pretty much every single thing that I have forecasted have come to pass within weeks or months of me saying it, with uncanny precision. So because I have that, it's because I have professional relationships, and that's why I have to fly under a moniker called V. And if you got a guy out there telling you, hey, guess what, guys? 
uh, they're about to bring this whole thing down. The hit teams are going to go into full effect. You're going to see bankers drop dead, and they're going to call it suicide. And then all of a sudden, it starts happening. You got to understand, this is a serious ball game. You see, I don't make, I don't put myself out there simply because you got 38 dead bankers already and counting. There's 43 on the list today. A guy from Goldman Sachs just took a dirt nap. Today, this today, afternoon. well, as we're yep. recording this, and this again is being recorded on on Monday, July twenty first. We're broadcasting it on Thursday, July twenty fourth. You're saying today, Monday, today, an executive, a Goldman Sachs executive, managing director. That's an ex- that's like a VP level position right there. Uh, what was the uh, what was the official cause of death? Uh, he uh, they don't know. He went he went uh, kite surfing. And they find him floating in the water uh, with his kite surfing gear on the shore. He just dropped dead. The investigation is still pending. And, and this is going to get dusted underneath the cover, just, to, just with everything else out there, folks. V, yeah, how, how, else out there. what was the, the time span between when you publicly stated that there was a, an assassination hit team that was going to take out bankers, and then when we saw the first... J.P. Morgan banker who jumped off the 33rd floor, there's that 33 again, jumped off the the roof of the 33rd floor uh, skyscraper. Uh, What was the time span between those two things? Between those two events, it was two months exactly. November the 10th is when I put the warning out. The first guy that dropped dead was Williams Brokesmith. He's the guy from Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank is the bank that I exposed that a lot of other guys are trying to take credit for. But uh, Deutsche Bank, uh, he, was a, he, he was a director over at Deutsche Bank, and the man wound up hanging himself uh, in his London home. He was the first to go. Then you had uh, um, uh, uh, the, the gentleman over in uh, J.P. Morgan in the U.K. that took a dive off the 33rd floor. Uh, in the middle, it was the, that, that cause of death, the man died at nighttime. They found his body during the day, and they changed. The witnesses' stories have been changed. I mean, they screwed with the evidence. Um, the, the kid was killed. And, and then so, the, the, shortly after that, another banker jumped yeah. off the J.P. Morgan building, and they 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 left his corpse lie there on the roof of the ninth floor for half the right. day. Yes. And I so what this, I said on the air was th- the killers wanted all of the employees in the building to get a good visual image burned into their brains of what happens if you mess with them. Absolutely. I've Absolutely. never heard of a body allowed to lay there for hours. Yep. Yeah, correct. Absolutely. It, for hours. And then you had witnesses who w- were initially witnesses, and then you see that their story falls apart. They try to, you know, put it together. Uh, they they don't want it leaking out there to the mainstream media that, hey, you know what, uh, this, this guy's body's been out there uh, on top of the roof for nine hours. Uh, let's go ahead and change that story. And all of a sudden, these eyewitnesses came out. Oh yeah, he jumped this morning. It just happened. So then, that was proven false. So the, you you have a lot of things happening, folks. It's, it's unprecedented. Obviously, you can't tell us sources, but regarding the assassination hit team of bankers, yeah, what's what's coming down, V? What's going on? Uh, okay, the way it works is we have massive levels of fraud, okay? The system has gotten desperate. The system has gotten so stressed to the stretching point that it is imperative that while they keep the doors of this thing open enough so they can extract as much wealth out of the Western banking system, they got to make sure that any sort of corroborating evidence that can prove their criminal activity is dealt with, okay? Uh, So what they're doing is they're tying up the loose ends. They're tying up the middle managers, the middle-level executives. These are the guys that are being silenced. Why? Well, whether you like it or not, these are the guys that there was an injunction, there was a court order, these are the gentlemen, and guess what they all work in? Data. They all deal with IT. They all deal with head of trading platforms, trading desks. So they see the trades that are done. They are aware of what's called dark pools, okay? Dark pools are exchanges within the bank itself where those who participate in the dark pool are privy to certain prices on certain trades. 
all illegal, by the way, and it's not even ethical. So these gentlemen have the, that data at hand that shows the effect not only of the dark pool, but also of high-frequency trades and the massive amount of fraud that is occurring within the derivatives market. So you take that together, you have an absolute megalithic criminal enterprise that's running the banking system of the United States as well as in Europe. And this is the thing that they want to do. They want to bring this whole thing down, Rick, and have total and complete plausible deniability. Years ago, there was a, a very popular uh, medical message uh, on recording that, that circulated around the United States. Uh, it was titled, Dead Doctors Don't Lie. Mm -hmm. So now we have, Dead Bankers Don't Testify. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because what they're doing, they're taking out the mid-level managers who actually carried out the criminal deeds. And they're being yep. eliminated, so they can't testify in a court of law about what they were instructed to do. Correct. Absolutely. And these are all these guys. Okay, just giving a, a, a little bit of detail here, folks. These are men who are successful. These are men at minimum with a seven-figure income. Okay, these are the guys that are being knocked off. They're not dying because all of a sudden they they felt with stress. Let me tell you about some of working in Wall Street. Stress and pressure is something we revel upon, okay? And there's a reason why Wall Street guys party like nobody's business. Because the level they, these guys work extremely hard in the most stressful of conditions, and they party even harder, okay? Um, some of these things are, you know, you, you, you've seen it in movies like The Boiler Room, The Wolf of Wall Street, uh, Glenn, uh, 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 the movie Wall Street. It just shows you the level that these guys play in. And uh, it really is that way. So it, all of a sudden, you got bankers that are stressed out. They're jump, jumping off of buildings. That don't make no sense whatsoever. Stress is part of the job. We welcome it. We, we, we do best in stress. Is the killing spree over, or has it just begun? It's, it's, it's far from over. It's far from over. My sources are telling me, we, you know, I'm still waiting for somebody from Citigroup to pop dead. Um, and that will that, possibly happen. Uh, you know, if, if, if it's 100% it's going to happen or not, I will be surprised if it doesn't. But uh, I'm, I'm expecting some, some uh, people to be who are connected with the Forex market. And the reason for Forex market, folks, is because of the massive amounts of fraud there with the U.S. dollar and the way they're manipulating that to keep the bond prices low and to keep the U.S. dollar index high to give everybody the impression that everything's fine, everything's okay. So there's massive amounts of fraud there. We've seen some people that are linked to Forex in some of the Swiss banks uh, go to jail. And we've seen some people that are linked to Forex in the American banks like Bank of America and Citigroup, who were all of a sudden reshuffled and their forex desks were closed down. So, and some of these guys were moved laterally. And moving somebody laterally is, is not a smart thing to do just because you dissolve a, a department. You want to make sure you silence all critics. So, this is why I expect you know, people and individuals that are connected with forex uh, to take a dirt nap soon. And if you're hearing my voice and you're somebody that's playing in forex with a major firm, um, I would be worried if I were you. How deep and extensive is the fraud and corruption in the Western banking system? That's a great question. It is corrupt from its foundation to the topmost stone. Uh, when you know, one of the things I always say, Rick, is when you cast off all anchors, and anchors means disciplinary structural fundamentals. Okay, within banking. When you and, and some of this is helps with, with having gold or silver or some sort of a commodity backing a currency helps mitigate fraud and helps mitigate the corruption. So when you're flying like the United States is, living off the printing press um, and, uh, and, and printing money with, with, with abandon, the fraud, because there's no anchors, is rife. There's no, if there's no anchors, there's no discipline. And when you have no discipline, folks, what do you have? You've got corruption on every level. You know, I talk to fools, you know, they tell me, well, you know, V, I've got a, a, a $10 million portfolio. I've got X amount of shares in this company, a couple of shares in Apple, a couple of shares in Google. And I look at them and say, you own nothing. You're a paper millionaire. You've got nothing. They're like, well, I own the stock. You don't own stock. Folks, let me, give, let me give you a reality check here. You don't own your house. 
You don't own your property, you don't own your land, and you don't own any stock in any company. You own what's called a beneficiary title, a beneficiary certificate. The real ownership of all the stocks, of all the bonds, of all the mortgages in this country is held at 55 Water Street called the DTCC. That's who holds it. So at any time, if you read, and that's a contractual obligation through the city of London, and at any time, they can cancel that is without that, your is that, approval. Is that the place that got flooded several years yes. ago? Yes. That's the one that right after Hurricane Sandy here in New York got flooded. And that <laughs> whoever heard of a vault being flooded, folks? Well, my, my thought when I read that was, well, there's the cover story for um, a future revelation that millions or billions shares of stocks and bonds were, were destroyed in a flood. Absolutely. And here's an, and, and if the flood wasn't enough, right after the flood, uh, about 21 days right after the flood, <laughs> the place caught on fire. <laughs> As a string of bad luck. Yeah. I mean, out of nowhere. I mean, you know, here we got vaults. All right. So our uh, listeners who have a stock portfolio, if they do not have physical possession of the stock certificate. They yep. don't own any stock. You don't own nothing. You have nothing. You don't touch, you don't have it. It's just that simple. Just like your mortgage. Just like your 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 your, your land. People tell me all the time, oh, I own my land, okay. Well don't play your property tax. You'll find out real quick who owns it. Have they rehypothecated stocks like they did gold? They're rehypothecating stocks on a daily basis. They're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Tell, tell our listeners what that means. Rehypothecation is this, folks. When I was in the U.K., we could rehypothecate to infinity. What that means is this. Let's just say you went ahead and you opened up a bank. You put money in a bank account, and you got an account in XYZ Bank. And I work for ABC Trading Company. ABC Trading Company goes to XYZ Bank and says, hey, XYZ Bank, your interest rates are so mediocre and low that there's no way, because of the market, that you're going to make any money sitting on client deposits. Why don't we, you know, do uh, some sort of some sort of deal here? Let's do a joint venture. Let's get involved in some trades, and we'll make some money. You can pledge your your clients or your customers' money sitting in their deposits under their names as collateral, and then all of a sudden, uh, XYZ Bank says, "Well, you know what?" Uh, they, you know, they say, well, the bank says, well, you know what, we, we could do that, but, you know, there's laws saying that we can't, we can't, you know, pledge our, our, our customers' our, our customers funds. Then all of a sudden, me, being the trading company, decides to lobby Congress and a couple politicians, and uh, they repeal certain regulations that are in place that allows me, as a trading company, as a brokerage firm, to start dabbling with commercial banks. Then on top of that, we start changing terminology, me and the bank together where you're no longer a depositor in a bank, you're a unsecured creditor. Meaning, as soon as you drop your money into your account, it's no longer yours. So then we take your account and we use it as collateral to hedge in all sorts of trades, predominantly in IR swaps, interest rate swaps, and the derivatives market. And if we wind up blowing everything, it's okay because your account has been pledged. And everything's hunky-dory so long as you and everybody else in the bank don't come knocking on the door screaming, saying, hey, I want my money out in cash now. So that's how the scheme works. And in the U.K., we were able to rehypothecate your account to infinity. In the United States, we limit it to about 140%. So in other words, if you got $100,000 sitting in your account, we can rehypothecate up to $140,000, and it's your money, and you're on the hook for it. Too bad. What would happen if millions of middle-class Americans who have a stock portfolio requested their physical stock shares? <laughs> it'll, be the, it'll be like the... Hundreds of millions of Americans requesting their mortgage titles from MERS, uh, it will absolutely crash the system. The whole thing will, the, 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 this, this, this whole, I mean, bankers will be hanging from lampposts along with the politicians. That, that That's what would happen. Not because uh, it's a, a, a an accounting 
a clerical nightmare to to find the shares and send them out, but because they don't exist? They, what well, people don't realize, with your mortgages, with MERS, as soon as you get a mortgage, MERS destroys your title in 30 days. That's a little dirty little secret, folks. Um, after that, they don't have physical title anymore. The uh, the DTCC they have all the physical contractual real stock certificates. Why why would um, MERS destroy the title in thirty days? Because what they do is they chop up the the deeds, they chop it all up, and they immediately put it in as collateral for back end trades on the market, as and they resell it as mortgage backed securities. In other words, your mortgage, alongside with millions of other mortgages, are chopped up and being sold right now and traded worldwide. Kind of like so that's sausage. Why you can't have a title on it. It's kind of like Again? making sausage. Oh yeah, it is a disgusting and sloppy process, Rick. Mm-hmm. So a piece of my mortgage is mixed in with a piece of your mortgage and a piece of my neighbor's mortgage and bundled up and sold to an investor in in Shanghai. Correct. All as, as securitized mortgage backed securities. And then when this thing goes pop, guess who comes and collects? That gentleman in Shanghai comes knocking on your door and says, get out of my house. What are your thoughts about uh, why J.P. Morgan sold their headquarters in New York City at, at uh, bargain basement price? And, and their basement just happened to include the world's biggest commercial gold vault. Why, why did it sell so cheaply to the Chinese? <laughs> Great question. I broke that story back in, uh, I think, September or uh, actually August of 2013 when that sale went, was uh, was going through. Folks, if you ever come down to New York, you ever go to Manhattan, One Chase Plaza is a, is a beautiful skyscraper, a very expensive piece of property. It's a four billion dollar, almost four billion dollar, you know, piece of property. J.P. Morgan sold it for 750 million dollars. Not even a third of what. what oh, that is a fraction of what it's worth. So the question becomes, what, what's going on over here? Well, the truth of the matter is, and I reported this, uh, you know, quite some time ago. The reason for this is this: if if people remember what occurred in 2012, in 2012 you had the London Whale, and as soon as the London Whale, you know, Bruno Excel, the famous trader, and this one, J.P. Morgan was bragging, hey, you know, we've had, you know, no trading losses, 180 days with no trading losses ever. And all of a sudden, here comes London Whale, and he, and he loses a ridiculous amount of money in the derivatives market. As soon as he's done that, he, they came, you know, J.P. Morgan did damage control. They said, oh, it's only $900 million. First it was $700 million, then it became $900 million. $900 million becomes $2 billion. $2 billion becomes $7 7 becomes 9 I came out and I said, no, it's over $100 billion. That's how much is lost. And then months later... What I said was absolutely verified. It was $120 billion plus that was lost on that derivatives trade by the London Whale. What most people didn't realize, what was rehypothecated or what was put up as collateral for that trade was Chinese gold. Okay? was Chinese gold sitting at the Bank of England. So when they lost that, they have to make, they have to make up for it. And that's why they sold their headquarters right here in downtown, One Chase Plaza in Manhattan, and the vault that goes underneath. And that vault, folks, is the largest private vault on the planet. It's the size of a football field. And it's seven stories underground, runs for underneath Liberty Street, connecting the J.P. Morgan vault to guess who? The New York Fed vault. And there you go. That's what happened with the whole entire deal, and that's the connection there. And who was also monitoring that trade with London Whale when he screwed that whole thing up? Well, it happened to be Ryan Crane. And what happened to Ryan Crane? Well, Ryan Crane just dropped dead in his Connecticut home. And who's Ryan Crane connected to? He's connected to that guy, McGee. That's the young gentleman who was also in charge of the IT and trade desk at J.P. Morgan who took a flight who decided to jump off the 33rd floor. Do you see the connections there? It's quite scary. It's quite scary. Um, We have a criminal cabal that's in control of much of the world right now. 
we have a satanic cabal. What I, 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 Rick, thank I like you, thank you, for, thank you for calling it what it is. That's what it yeah. is. This is, is this thing is demonic. It's it is satanic. It is it is evil to the bone. Yeah. Absolutely. I will tell your listeners really quickly what has occurred to me. One of the reasons why I had an epiphany and I had to wake up. As a young trader, I was you know going down the corridor and. We were brokering a major deal here. I remember so clearly at, 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 at basically at our headquarters, at our corporate building, walking down the hallway at 7.30 in the morning, me and a compatriot of mine, and I see the conference room door open. And I said to myself, you know, that's pretty strange. Why is the conference room door open? Why are the lights on? And why is anybody in there? Because I didn't see anybody uh, booking the conference room at this time nor this day. And as I approached and walking with my compatriot, I, I felt a, a very very strange, foreboding, heavy presence and energy emanating from that conference room um, door and from that room itself. And as I approach, you know, you got the windows on the side of the, of, of the, of the conference room and you got the door in the, in the middle. I look in and all of a sudden I see the CEO, the CFO, the chairman of the board, a couple of members of the chair, the CI, the chief investment strategist, CIS, they're all holding hands and they're chanting these Kabbalistic prayers with all sorts of occultic, esoteric paraphernalia strewn about the table. And one of the things that really stood out to me was a red triangle. And that, and being from New York, I don't scare easily. You can pull out a gun, I'd, I'd probably laugh at you. But that scared me. That's when I realized these guys, at some level, there's something more than just human human issues and human wants and desires that are, that are occurring. There is something more that is not only driving this thing, but guiding it to its eventual end. What did that experience do to you spiritually? It woke me up. It, 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 it really, at, the, you know, at that point, you know, I, I was a former atheist. I became Christian. I was actually saved under Pastor David Wilkerson's ministry. <clears throat> And after that, you know, working in Wall Street, living the fast life, you kind of, even though I wasn't a, a bad person, I wasn't out there living for the world, I kind of put God on the back burner, so to speak. I kind of became a nominal, lukewarm kind of Christian. But that moment right there, folks, what it wrong home to me was God's wake-up call saying, look at the beast system emerging. And that's the thing that I cannot escape from. Knowing that I am seeing the emergence, the integration, and the total control of a beast system, the Antichrist system that is taking place not only in the trading firm that I was working in, but it is bringing to unison every single firm, every single investment bank, bankers, politicians, and military industrial complex uh, individuals, all of it together. There is a consciousness system. that is congelling in the world. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. You cannot have, when you have things that happen here and there, that, that's circumstance. But when you have a successive string of events that occur, you can either say one thing. Number one, you can say everybody's stupid and they're purposely, uh, and they're all wrecking the, uh, the economy uh, whether they realize it or not, these are just idiotic politicians and bankers and, and whatnot and businessmen. That's one level. But when the pattern begins to emerge, and when you really take a step back and look at it, you realize, wait a minute, this is not a bunch of imbecilic baboons that are, you know, pushing buttons and, and, and accidents are happening left and right, and, 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 and all sorts of trade and fraud is happening left and right. No, this is a well-orchestrated precision action that is being done over and over again. You no longer have coincidence, Rick. You have a clear-cut agenda. Do, 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 you remember, else, do you remember the House of Representatives stenographer, Diane Reddy? I interviewed her and her husband. Yeah, she's the woman that, that stood up in the yes. at the podium in the well of the, of the House of Representatives and began, began prophesying that 
that uh, the country was uh, under the control of Freemasonry. Correct. Yeah. What is right. happening, V, and I, I, this, I'm convinced of this, that what is coming together is the satanic government that ruled the entire planet before Noah's flood. Correct. They're back. That's what's coming back. They are back. They are so, back. And so, let me tell you guys, this is a, this is a, look, what, what's happening is that these people worship Lucifer. Okay, now I'm going I'm to start saying things that I, I've never said before. And I, I've been pretty quiet in the last 18 months I've been on the air, but I'm going I'm I'm to spill my beans a little bit here. <clears throat> these guys believe in this entity called Lucifer. They worship him. They believe that he's a brother and friend and the savior of mankind. They believe that he's going to grant them real freedom, real uh, eternal life, real salvation. They are obsessed with breeding. That is why if you look at every major city in the world, like New York, London, uh, um, the Vatican, we all have, in D.C., we all have obelisks. The obelisk is a phallic symbol. It's basically a penis, for those that don't know what a phallic symbol is. And what it is, it's their cross. That is their cross. Okay, The cross for us as a believer is, is our way to salvation. It's, it's God's way of salvation. Their cross, the obelisk, is salvation through breeding, salvation through higher and higher levels of, of, of evolution and of breeding and, uh, and bringing it all together. That's their belief. That's why the bloodlines are so important to them. Very, very important. Now, what, what Lucifer and, and, and his minions are doing, they are building a what, what, you know, what some of us guys are calling the God machine, Okay. It is a global integrated computer consciousness. It is a machine consciousness. Throughout the world, throughout the galaxies, they have their relics and ruins are scattered throughout the universe. Okay? You see their relics on Mars, on the moon, on Venus, on various planets. This is they believe. I'm not, you know, whether you believe it or not, it doesn't even matter to me. This is what You're telling believe. us what they believe. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay? So uh, they, they've lost that. So they have a machine consciousness, okay? Uh, that's how they're able to move, is they're able to work within the circuits. Again, this is their belief. Hence, it is very important that they do this last-minute push in order to take humanity to the ultimate level of control. That's why you can never be saved if you receive the mark of the beast, because the mark of the beast is a microchip that as soon as it's implanted, you cannot be saved at all because now you're able to be possessed by this machine consciousness, which is this Lucifer. Okay. Now there's going to be some people saying, "Oh, V is saying that that Lucifer is a, is a robot." I'm not telling you that at all. I'm just telling you that it's just a conduit from which he is able to transcend from his dimension into ours and manipulate into our dimension. So because here, is, here's uh, here's what's happening, V. Satan, because he is not a creator. Correct. He has no power of creation he in order for him to become a god and and try to to look like the true god of the universe he has to use science and technology absolutely in order to replicate the supernatural power of the one true living god absolutely you, you nailed it on the head that's exactly what, it, what this whole thing is and they, these guys look here's the thing rick these guys are trying to escape judgment we're talking about these fourth dimensional entities they're trying to escape judgment. They believe they can keep downloading their consciousness over and over and over and over and over again into machines, that they can somehow escape the judgment to come. And that's the promise they give to their followers, that you shall not die, but you shall all live, and God is a liar. Do, do you know the early church in the first several centuries, what, what they taught about demons— is totally different than what most Christians believe today, because you, you ask a typical Christian, even pastor, and they'll say a demon is a fallen angel. And that's not what the early church taught. They Correct. taught they taught that the fallen angels were, were chained in Tarsus, as the Bible says, and that the, that the demons were the spirits, the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. That's, that's exactly right. The creatures that were produced by the sexual union between the fallen angels and human women. And because these creatures, Nephilim, 
were not, uh, you know, they were hybrids. They, they, they were, they, it was a bizarre creature. They had, their souls had no place to go. And so their souls have been wandering around on the planet, in the universe, for thousands of years, and they have to inhabit, they have to live inside a living creature. That is possession. Absolutely. And there are absolutely there are millions of human beings walking around who are just possessed people. They're zombies. They're possessed by Nephilim. I would, I would, Rick, I would so far say billions. Yeah. I would say so also. Mm -hmm. Hey, let me tell you a true story. Uh, this happened a long time ago, so the, you know I want I want our audience to understand that this this um, this demonic, satanic, Luciferian empire uh, didn't just arise in recent years. It's been growing and building and plotting for century, actually since since the flood. I mean that's how long it's uh, it's been out there trying to to be resurrected. Uh, God right. God put the kibosh on that thing with the great flood. And it's taken thousands of years for Satan to rebuild his empire. He, I mean, he got squashed big time. Of course, he's going to get squashed again, but this will this will be for good. But this this really happened to me uh, a long, long time ago. I, I was in my 20s. My, my wife, Susan, was pregnant with our second uh, child, which is our son, Jeremy. This happened in, uh, I'm going to say, February of 1979. I, as I said, I was in my twenties. Um, you know, um, you know, we were we were enjoying the Jimmy Carter economy. Uh, you know, for those of you who <laughs> can remember the the wonderful times of Jimmy Carter, uh, mortgages at eighteen percent and unemployment. You know, it was just horrible time. And here I was, this young father with two now one child, another child on the way. And man, I was, you know, working and struggling to make it happen. And well, anyhow, um, V, I bought a, uh, I bought a, a life insurance policy. I'm going to name the company. I could care less. Are they, you know, they're not going to sue me because I'm telling the truth. You know, they're never going to take me to court uh, on this one because it's the truth. Uh, they don't want this to be exposed. But I bought a life insurance policy with a, uh, a fraternal. So, organization called Woodman of the World. Now, I wasn't, you know, I I was saved. I was a brand new Christian. I, I, I was a brand new, I got saved in June of 1978. And this was, uh, this happened to me, like I said, around February 1979. And so I bought this life insurance policy. And one day, the man who sold it to me, and I remember his name, his name was Earl Cup. C-U-P-P. -P. He was the state manager of Woodman of the World for the state of Maryland. He came to see me, and I was kind of surprised. He showed up, and he said, he said, Rick, I've got something I want you to consider. And I, and I said, okay, Earl, what's that? And he said, I want you to go to work for me. And I was kind of surprised, and he, he said, I've got a, an awesome opportunity for you. And so he went through this presentation with uh, Woodman of the World and showed me how, you know, I would be the regional representative for the organization. And, you know, I had all this uh, prestige that would come with, you know, being the official representative in, in my hometown and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff, you know. And then he yeah. said, you know, he says, now, listen, I'm, you know, uh, if you say yes, uh, he said, every uh, every two weeks, I'm going to cut a check for X many Dollars and it was a staggering amount to me at that time. I mean, it was like make your eyeballs turn around, you know, when you're in your twenties, you know, uh -huh. with a second kid on the way. And I'm like, look, and I said, are you for real? And he goes, no. He goes, uh, he goes, uh, I, I'm going to do this every week. He goes, I. He says, I believe in you. And I said, so I. So when he left, you know, uh, you know, my pregnant wife said, um, you're going to say yes, right? And I go, well, I got to pray about it. She goes, pray about what, well, you know. We need the money, you know. So, <laughs> so you know, family, you know, you share with family, and everybody's like, "You got to take this. This is your big break," you know, all those kind of stuff. But something in my spirit just said, "This ain't right. Something's not right." And um, so, anyhow, what happened was, even though I had to check in my spirit, I, I, I bent under the pressure of family members saying, "You would be crazy to turn down this job," you know. So I went ahead and said yes, and he said, okay, he says, we're going to send you out to Omaha, Nebraska for uh, 
I think it was a week or maybe two weeks of, of training. And so when I got to the airport, it was just a little regional airport. Mr. Cup was there and he wanted to say goodbye to me. And he, he, I had a, a, I had a Jesus first lapel pen on my, on my, <laughs> on my jacket. And he, he said, Rick, he said, can I put this Woodman of the World pen on you? And I said, well, sure. And he started to take the Jesus pen off. I said, no, you don't have to take that off. And he goes, well, I didn't think you wanted a second hole in your jacket. I said, it's, I don't, it's, it's okay. He started to take it off again. And I said, no, you can leave that on. Put, put that other one right there. And he said, I, I think we should take this off. And I looked right at him, you know, stared him in the eye. And I said, sir, it's Jesus first. That means Woodman is second. Second, right. All right. And it got real icy cold. Okay. So then I get on the plane, uh, changed planes in Chicago, and just happened that the young guy sitting beside me he was on his way to Omaha. Turns out he has a job with Woodman. And I said, hey, did anything weird happen to you? He goes, yeah, at the airport, my, my manager said, hey, you realize that when you come home, you're going to resign your part-time position as a youth pastor. And I said, Really? And he goes, yeah. He says, I was really surprised that he said that to me, you know. So anyhow, we get to Omaha, the big skyscraper, Woodman of the World, all this stuff. And I walk in and, I, and we met a met the Southern Baptist guy. OK, and I'm tell, we're telling him all this stuff, saying something weird in there. And I felt that presence that you were describing. The moment right. I walked in the lobby of that skyscraper, I felt. I mean, I can smell Satan. He's a he's got an odor. And I, I, I just was aware of his presence there. And this uh, high official walks up to me and he goes, have you three guys been initiated? And I looked up and I said, no. And he said, uh, tomorrow night, 7 p.m., meet me at such and such place. You're going to be initiated. And I, and somebody, as soon as he walked away, I said, did you hear what he said? He said, initiate it. Well, the Southern Baptist guy is saying, Oh, come on, man. You're just, you're, you know, you're really getting far out here. You know, it's, it's a welcoming party. I said, no, no. He said, initiate it. So it really bothered me, you know. So I, between classes, I sneaked off and I opened up a room and I go inside this this room that you're not supposed to be in. And yeah. it's, it's full. It's It's got all of these artifacts from the Grand Pooba. Who who started the Woodman of the World Insurance Fraternal Society? Yeah, Joseph Root. Yeah, you know who I'm talking about. I mean, yeah, he's got Joseph Connery. The guy was a thirty second or thirty three degree mason. You better believe it. And all of his yeah. all of his paraphernalia from the <clears throat> Masons was in there. This was like a shrine to this yeah. guy. Okay, and I'm in there looking at this stuff, and I go, Oh no, I'm 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 in something. I got to get out of. So I went. <laughs> um, I went up to the um, top floor, the executive floor. I walked in. I put on my best poker face, and I looked at the secretary, and I said, uh, I'm supposed to pick up a copy of the ritual. And she just looked at me and said, oh, okay. And she went back somewhere and came out and handed me this little I think it was a blue book. It would, you know, basically fit in your shirt pocket. And I just walked out the door and went, I don't believe I got this thing. Went back to my hotel room, read it. This thing was demonic. It was a demonic Freemason-like ritual. And to make this story short, here's what happened. All of the new salesmen, and this was to sell life insurance, we were right. we were required to go into a room with no lights on and they were they had a human skull with a lantern shining on the skull and all of the inductees uh, the recruits into the company was required to get on their knees and sing the ode to the skull now i refused to do it and you know I was get, I was leaving class one day and they they confronted me these uh, goons confronted me and said <laughs> said you you're going with us and they took us up to the top floor to the vice president and um I got 
I, I was told, he literally said to me, the, you will bow. And I said, I will not bow. And it got very, very tense. And I, and I told him, I said, I will not bow. I will not participate. And he said, you're the first person in 100 years to refuse. I said, I hope I start a trend. And he called his secretary and he said, get this guy a plane ticket back to Maryland. And he took his wallet out and he shoved this money in my face. He said, there, kid, go catch a cab and get out of here. And I shoved it back and I said, I won't touch your filthy money. And I walked out the door. It was snowing. And I flew back. I flew back to Maryland. I had quit my job. My wife is pregnant. Okay. It's the winter time. But you know what? God honored me. And I got, I saw up front, there are demonic powers in some of these major corporations. These people are Luciferian, devil-worshipping freaks. Yep. That's who's running the financial system of this world. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Well, this interview has uh, taken a turn I I did not prepare. We've got uh, (laughs) seven minutes uh, if you can hold over, uh, yeah, sure. and we'll do tomorrow's program. But let's we've got seven minutes here before the closing music starts. Let's go back to what we were talking about uh, with the economy. Um, you mentioned earlier that when people put their money in a bank now, they're not a depositor. They are an unsecured creditor. When did Correct. that when did that change take place? I believe my memory serves me correctly. Uh, I believe it was about a year ago. With the yeah, with yeah. The, with the Barney Frank, Chris Dodd bill. I be, uh, yes, the Dodd Frank took it a little further. They basically Dodd Frank bill says it outright that they're going to bail you in. In other words, if a bank is in trouble, uh, they will confiscate uh, your 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 account and use it to help bail the bank in to get it out of trouble. Uh, when you will get repayment, could be anywhere between zero and ninety nine years if. Any, because you're being an unsecured creditor, you're going to be the last online to get the divvies from the bank that just went under. And this is in effect now? This is in effect now, folks. For every bank account in the United States? Correct. Every single one of them. So all of our listeners who have checking and savings accounts in a, in their local bank, you are an unsecured creditor to the bank and if the bank goes under your money is the first that their grubby paws are going to grab absolutely it's just outright thievery oh yeah and and the craziest part is rick the american doesn't care he doesn't care because this is some conspiracy theory or this is some far off event and it's not going to happen to him and he's immune and he's miraculously protected and everything's hunky dory. Uh, Reality is going to hit them in the face very soon. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. How much how much time do you think we have left? before reality is up close and personal? That is the proverbial $1.4 quadrillion question, Rick. And, uh, you know, with so many things happening, you know, people got to understand, this is a multi-dimensional 3, 4D chess game that's going on. It's move, counter move. You got so many thousands of variables involved. And oftentimes when we put together a date, we could be off by six months, we could be off by a year. But for the latest intel that I can tell you from my sources, we're looking at some time, uh, end of 2015, to be the complete uh, demise of the dollar in the sense of world reserve currency. In other words, people losing total and complete respect for it, and then 2017 being the uh, putting the kibosh on the United States as we know it exists today. I, I've mentioned this many times on the program, this classic uh, front cover of, of The Economist magazine, I think it's January 1988. you got to remember The Economist is uh, owned by the Rothschilds family. So, so right. always know who owns what news media outlet you're, you're getting your news and information from. But The Economist magazine, January 1988, the main story was the coming global currency. And the, the image on the front cover 
is a phoenix standing in a pile of burning paper money. And it's all the money, all the currencies of the world on fire. And around the, the neck of the phoenix is a a gold medallion. There you go. And it it is called the phoenix. That's the currency, the phoenix. And the date stamped into it, engraved into it, is 2018. And when you wow. read the 1988 Economist magazine about the coming global currency, it says... At the end of the article, watch for the breakup of the uh, fiat paper money sometime around 2018 and the emergence of the Phoenix currency. These, that, that makes perfect sense. These Luciferian devil-worshipping demoniacs have had this plan, we know, for decades. Who knows? A century or two? We don't know. But they are implementing their plan, which is going to, which they believe is going to give them total control over the planet. Absolutely. We've got about two minutes, uh, actually about 90 seconds. Uh, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask V to um, um, just hang on the phone. And, and then when we close out this program, we're going to uh, come back. And I'm going to record part two, which we will air on Friday. V, thank you so much. Let's just take a break, and then I'll be back in one minute. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, you're listening to True News, the End Time Newscast. Over 16 years, listener-supported True News has been the champion of news and content not heard in the mainline media. True News has expanded its message to 12 hours a day, 7 days a week on two international shortwave stations. At almost 9,000 hours of programming a year, we now produce or broadcast Revelation Ready, End Times Outpost, True News, Strength for the Journey, Preparing for the End Times, Real Science Radio, Homecoming more amazing content is coming. We reach out through radio, YouTube, blog talk, shortwave, and our new smartphone app with over 22,000 downloads. True News is spreading the message of the second coming of Jesus Christ because of your faithful support to this vital message. A message like no other. But we can only go so far with the resources we have. Keep the message growing and strong. Support True News. Go to truenews.com to see how you can keep spreading this critical message. That's T-R-U-N-E-W-S dot com. And we're at the close of the program. And uh, I, I want to mention something that I read a few days ago. Uh, do you all know who Richard Russell is? He's, uh, he's considered the grandfather of financial newsletters. He's, uh, he's 89 years old. He's, that newsletter is... I mean, itself is that newsletter is older than dirt. He's been writing that thing for decades. And he he said a few days ago, I woke up last night and remembered a dream. The five the leaders of five nations and their economists met in a town in New Mexico. The town's name is Last Chance. The nations that met were China, Russia, Germany, France and America. The five nations decided that a new currency is needed. The new currency will be made up of money from from the five nations plus $10,000 an ounce gold. But the shocker is that the five nations will declare a year of jubilee when all the debts are canceled. And it will set off a worldwide collapse of securities. But the world leaders agreed the solution is better than World War III. 